right now we're going to be joined by Manhattan Borough President Gail Brewer, who is a great friend to this show. And we're going to talk to her about what she's been doing to support us all during this pandemic. And uh, hi, Gail. How are you? I'm wonderful. It's great to be here. You know, I love MNN. I love the rep NYC represent. And thank you for including me in it. You're, you're more than welcome. Um, you know, you've hosted Represent NYC many times and, and we just, we miss you. We can't wait for you to be back in the studio with us. <laughs> I agree. Um, so I want to talk to you a little bit about what's been happening. You've been working nonstop since New York City and New York State has been shut down. And what have the challenges been? I know um, I've seen you tweet and talk about just things like the seniors and getting them food. Tell me about what you've been doing in that area. Well, you're right. I mean, the first issue was, are the seniors getting food? Because every senior was told to stay in his or her apartment. And seniors, whom I know, many of them go to the senior center. And the senior center was closed. So the question is, then became, how do they get food? It was very confusing at first, because of course, the senior centers, they were still trying to provide food running around to the neighborhood. Then the city said, the seniors had to grab and go, which didn't make a lot of sense because they're supposed to stay in their apartments. And then the city said, call 311, we'll get you food. That didn't work so well because everybody was calling 311 and the seniors couldn't get through. And then what happened was the senior centers didn't have a list of who is on my delivery list. At that point, uh, some of the large catering companies uh, we're delivering to the senior center, and then the senior center and the city were providing uh, runners to go to the apartments. But even some of the seniors at NYCHA, for instance, the doors were broken, the intercom was broken, they couldn't get in. So you can see the challenges. Um, and then sometimes the food that came from the 311 system wasn't appropriate, either it wasn't kosher, it wasn't halal, or to be honest with you, it wasn't nutritious. Long story short, here we are. Uh, in May 2020, and I think to the credit of Catherine Garcia and others, at this point, the senior centers now have a list of who is on their list. They can go to a portal and get that information. And then secondly, um, if you are on the list of the senior center, then you're going to get a meal nine times a week that's going to take care or nine, for nine days. And you're going to get something that's appropriate for your dietary restrictions because now nutritionalists are also working with those uh, senior centers. How do people get on that list? Do they oh, still? Uh, obviously, there's two ways. You can still call 311 and you will get, you still have to call a couple of times a week. But in addition, you can call our office uh, and we will be able to uh, get you on a list. Or you can just call your senior center if you know what it is and they will tell you you're on the list you're gonna get the right meal every single week and you'll be on it until the end of the pandemic. So you don't have to worry about whether you're gonna get food. So to answer your question is you could still call 311. Sometimes they know their senior center. You can call our office. Um, my direct number is 212-669-8191. It goes right to my cell phone. And um, if you know what your senior center is, then you can contact them. So at least it's a system that works in terms of there is a system and the food is excellent in terms of nutrition and less salt and less sugar and in terms of your appropriate diet. Let me ask you, you mentioned NYCHA. There has, there's always been challenges with NYCHA and the residents being able to get repairs and even just the health issues in the buildings. How has this pandemic affected NYCHA and what has been done to give them more support, if, if any? Well, you know, NYCHA had tons of issues before the pandemic, and certainly uh, they have been exasperated. Uh, we've been working with Fresh Direct. Fresh Direct at first in Manhattan was uh, generously donating their services for three weeks, and then to the credit of the mayor, he picked up Fresh Direct, and now they're being paid by the city to deliver to NYCHA, uh, particularly for the seniors because as you know, the seniors who are residents of NYCHA, they often go to a senior center and that center is closed, except for keeping track of whether or not they're getting a meal. So the answer to your question is cleaning. 
uh, it's a problem and always has been a problem. Uh, the city has hired cleaning companies to supplement what the NYCHA workers do because many NYCHA workers are ill um, and more cleaning is needed. So the senior buildings, there are some buildings that are 100% senior are supposed to be cleaned every day and so-called family buildings, which often have a lot of seniors in them, are cleaned three times a week. However, the same problems of repairs, roofs, mold, all those other issues that are endless at night just still exist. And we're gonna have to see after this uh, horrible virus is waning. I don't wanna say ended because we don't know what's gonna happen, but it is waning and there's some recovery, how NYCHA bounces back and how much money comes from the federal government to be able to supplement this huge backlog of repairs because it's the repairs that are the challenge at NYCHA. So let me switch gears. You mentioned um, money, right? And the city has is, is been financially devastated by this pandemic. Everything shut down. All our revenue streams have been cut off. I want to talk about the budget cuts and specifically the, the summer youth employment program. Um, there, it's been shut down for 2020. Um, I think it's something like 75,000 kids won't be able to get employment through this program and it affects nonprofits. But there's been this huge call, right, for this to be returned. What are your thoughts on what will happen here? Well, we had a discussion with many youth directors, uh, a YouTube hour long discussion. And obviously we feel very strongly it should be in the budget. And I know the city council leadership and many, many members feel the same way. Last year, to the credit of the mayor, there were 75,000 young people, as you indicated, and I think it's around $121, $124 million program. Um, that was the largest number ever in the history of SYEP. We absolutely need SYEP in summer 2020. We don't know the status of our city at that point. Some people say we won't be back, if at all, in fully recovery stage until maybe sometime next year, certainly not this summer. But what you don't want is young people with nothing to do as they have had cooped up experiences until now. So there are so many great issues that can be addressed by young people. For example, um, there's lots of virtual possibilities, teaching, learning, sharing. All of the youth development directors have come up with a lot of them. Second, we're still gonna to have to be getting people food. I just mentioned the challenges of getting food to seniors. I can't tell you how long the lines are at the food pantries. And look at how many people are unemployed and are gonna need food. So just having the young people help with that effort would be huge. Third, the mayor and the governor are hiring tracers, contact tracers, people to go to find out if I'm sick, if you're sick, if our brother's sick, whom have we been in touch with? And that's another job that could in fact be done by some young people during the summer, peer to peer, young person to young person. That's a much better way to address some of these health concerns. So I know that there are many other ideas, but that's just some of them. And we absolutely need to have young people employed in a way so that they are feeling productive, and we don't have any challenges that could exist if they're not employed. They need funding for school, obviously. They need their jobs that need to be done. So we're very much in support of SYEP. And for anybody who is listening and watching, know that the youth development organizations have come up with phenomenal ways to do it in a healthy social distancing and sometimes virtual way. There's even, I think there's a hashtag, like hashtag save S-Y-E-P. So, I mean, if you can tweet it, tweet it. Um, so let's talk a little bit about the reopening. You know, th there's a four-part prong plan and, you know, a lot of people are not clear. Can you give us some clarity on what it would look, look like for Manhattan to reopen? I will try. Um, okay. the, governor, the governor has a four-part plan, as you indicated. Um, the governor is in charge of opening deadlines to a large extent. Um, on May 15th, which is this coming Friday, there will in fact be five upstate counties opening. So it'll be interesting to see, even though they're so much smaller and not dense like New York City, but that's happening. 
New York City, it's not clear. Nobody has said when we are leaving our apartments or when there's any opening. There is a possibility in happening construction and manufacturing. Manufacturing is ongoing. I, I'm delighted that uh, the folks in the garment center in Manhattan and even in Brooklyn are sewing. Uh, obviously we need masks, we need surgical gowns and there's an ongoing. And there are folks who are doing face shields and other manufacturing. So manufacturing has been done in a socially distancing way. Temperatures taken as people enter. Um, and the same thing with construction. I know the construction is something that um, the developers and the unions want to keep going. It's controversial because when you're living next door to a construction site in your home all day, and you're trying to teach your kids, it can be a real challenge. But those are the two first in New York City in terms of opening. It's not clear to us about restaurants and hotels and uh, stores and so on. I will say that there's a lot of planning going on. And let me give you an example. The restaurants really want open space. They want streets to be closed. Often their sidewalks are very narrow. And there is the belief that if I wanna to go to a restaurant, I'm much happier to be outside than I am inside. And obviously if I'm inside, there have to be many fewer of us sitting around at the table. So there is a push right now by um, hospitality groups and restaurant groups uh, to see how we can use the streets in a different way. Can I ask you a question though? There's also the, the open streets plan that has been, that has started. You were a big advocate for that. Is yeah. that connected to that? Yes, of course. The mayor started out with open streets near parks. At the same time, the business improvement districts, which are the local chambers of commerce, they're dying to have, and I get called all day long, to have the street on their block open so that they can have plazas and streets open for uh, people who want to dine and they'll put out the tables. But there are lots of issues. Like normally you can't, you know, just serve liquor out there. You can't uh, do uh, sort of uh, without a waiter under the current rules and regulations. And obviously the outdoor cafes can be very expensive if you file for a permit. So there are many, many issues regarding state SLA, state liquor authority, and city regulations about how you have an outdoor cafe. And so these are things that are being worked on as we speak. The other issue that's going on in a uh, recovery mode is what we call the TTT, the testing, the tracing, and the treatment. And testing, we know we need more sites. The tracing, both the mayor and the governor are hiring uh, many people to do the tracing. They're being trained by Johns Hopkins and they're gonna start very soon. And so if I am ill, I say so, they find out, and they check with my friends, where have I been? And all of that will be put into a database, hopefully uh, privacy, all rules in effect, uh, to go to Johns Hopkins. And then that will be used to find if there are hot spots or figuring out ways how we can be healthier. So uh, these are just some of the issues. And of course we are recovery, the moratorium on pain uh, getting evicted for anything at all goes into August 20th. I can tell you that the other phone call is, in addition to the small businesses and the food, it is, what about my rent? Because I am unemployed. I have or I have not gotten my unemployment insurance. Um, how am I going to pay for my rent? And some people aren't eligible for unemployment insurance for a whole series of reasons. Sometimes they can get through, sometimes they can't to the State Department of Labor. They will eventually, if they're eligible, they will get their money, but what happens if it's not enough, et cetera. So you can imagine that's another issue of what is it gonna look like? I don't want people to end up in housing court on August 21st, and how right. do we prevent all of that? Yeah, there's a big push for forgive rent, cancel rent, and I mean, I don't know what the reality of that is gonna be, um, but come the end of the stay of evictions, there, there could be a run on the courts um, and that could create this new homelessness situation in New York City. Um, I wanna talk, you mentioned small businesses. Small businesses, are, they're the backbone of the city. And one of the major revenue streams, again, is restaurants. And how do you see, um, and tourism, I wanna talk to you about those two things. How do you see us creeping back to some sense of normalcy or, or should we just forget about the way it used to be and just get ready for the new normal? 
Well, I think um, it definitely is being discussed in a very systemic way, and that's positive. So there's two kinds of discussions going on in Manhattan. One is New York City and Company, known as NYC and Company, headed up by Fred Dixon. I'm on the board, and we talk every single week. And on that phone call are obviously the restaurants, the hotels, um, the Javits Center, which of course has industry uh, conventions on a regular basis, and then others who are interested in tourism, obviously the culturals. The culturals are but bring the museum, the theater, bring people to New York. So the original most recent discussion is tourism is going to return only locally. In other words, people will not be coming from overseas. They'll be coming from D.C. to Maine, perhaps, or up to Canada. When does the Canadian border open? Those are the kinds of suggestions that are being made. So that's how tourism is being looked at at this moment. Second, Broadway, as you know, is not going to open until the fall. Um, and then the third is in terms of restaurants, as I indicated, what is the new norm? And I think it will be very different. I suggested opening up a street. Of course, as somebody from the restaurant industry pointed out, when it rains and when it's hot, people may not want to be on the street. So how many people are allowed in the building? Who wears masks? Can you do a self-serve? These are all the issues that are being considered. And as the person from the restaurant industry indicated, what we don't want are chain stores. We want to keep our local, either fine dining or mom and pop restaurants to be, uh, which is why people come to New York City. So it is a hard uh, decision uh, as to who's going to open and who's not. We want to keep as many as possible. At the same time, the Harlem Chamber of Commerce has been meeting. We talk every single uh, week with all of the Harlem legislators, the banks, uh, business improvement districts in Harlem, and trying to figure out for Harlem what makes sense. And again, you have great cultural institutions, you have um, you know, phenomenal businesses, restaurants, and it's the same kind of issues. You know, But Harlem is always challenged because of the uh, location in terms of people's income and wanting to make sure that um, it's not forgotten. So we are uh, constantly working on those two uh, discussions and uh, projections. I can't say anybody has answers, but I can give you the silver lining is everybody's thinking about how they can come back. I know in some cases, uh, restaurants have been open serving either Harlem Hospital, Metropolitan Hospital, Mount Sinai, and in many cases, whether it's Central Harlem or uh, East Harlem, this has been going on. It's also the 100th anniversary of the Harlem Renaissance. And here we are in 2020, so it's going to be celebrated in 2021. But exactly what that entails is still being discussed. But these are all uh, topics that, to the credit of people who are putting these thoughts together, it's been done systemically and it's been done openly and transparently. And everybody's input is welcome. Let me uh, switch gears again and ask you about the MTA. Now, the shutdown from 1 a.m. to 5 a.m. and the cleaning. And, and I mean, this is how people get to Manhattan. And it's been um, a, a big complaint about the homelessness and people sleeping and just the state of the MTA as it stands now. What are your thoughts on how that's been working, the disinfecting? The MTA and the buses. I know when I get on a bus, I've been on a bus a lot recently going to different uh, food serving situation where we're trying to be helpful. Um, the buses, you get on the back door and it's, I, the buses I've been on have been clean. Um, obviously you don't pay in this uh, particular uh, virus situation because you don't want the bus driver to be, uh, you know, near any of us. So there's a big chain that says do not come anywhere closer and it's always seemed very clean in the bus. I've been on the subway a few times going down to uh, City Hall area. And before, I have to be honest with you, before the uh, governor uh, and the MTA ordered the cleaning and individuals are homeless were uh, told to leave at one o'clock, it was pretty dicey and dirty. Um, it's improved dramatically. And of course, we're all concerned about the homeless at the same time. And I've been on several calls with the commissioner banks and others on that topic. But in terms of the subways being cleaner as a result of the cleaning, I have to say 
That is definitely true from my experience. I do know that the subways will in the future be open again 24 hours a day. We have a, at some point a nightlife industry, which is billions of dollars um, that needs to be returning. And we have people who need to get to work. So that cannot be a permanent closure. How we deal with the ongoing cleanliness, how you get money from the federal government to deal with it. We need a lot more than the three or four billion that just came in. We need a lot more than that. The census. There has been a low turnout or a low return, right? And how can we get that message out? I mean, and secondly, we have the absentee ballot for the primary coming up on the 23rd and of June. And people are concerned about that process. Can you talk to me a little bit about those two things? Sure. In terms of the census, it's low. We obviously in Manhattan have been pushing hard. We're second to Staten Island. We want to beat Staten Island. But the city as a whole needs to drastically improve. The, uh, there, you know, it's simple. You simply, it's 10 minutes maximum, phone call, online, et cetera. And um, it's interesting. People who are away on the east side, for instance, very, very low numbers on the east side of Manhattan. And I am nervous because they should know that they can fill it out no matter where they are. Um, we just have to keep pushing. I mean, there is a distrust of government. This is what is it's manifesting itself in the census. Um, even though we have uh, time into the fall, the deadline has been extended, we need people now to fill it up. So all I can tell you is there are billions of dollars at stake. So here we are trying to make sure that the MTA, that the city's budget and so many other summer youth programs, education, et cetera, are funded. Um, without the census, that's not gonna happen. Every student who is in the public school system gets $2,700 from the federal government if we fill out the census in a complete way. Obviously, the fewer people who fill it out, the fewer students who are gonna get funding. So, and in terms of the absentee ballot, we'll all get a opportunity to send in a ballot in the mail. So the Board of Elections is gonna send all of us, all New Yorkers, dear New Yorker, if you are registered uh, Democrat, you can, for the June primary, you're gonna have the opportunity to fill out a request for a ballot. So it's not the ballot itself, it's a request for the ballot. You send that back and then you'll get a ballot to fill out and you can vote either by mail for the, September, for the uh, June primary, or you can go to the poll yourself. Wonderful, thank you so much. I wanna finish out by letting people know you have this wonderful newsletter that comes out. So I want you to tell people how they can get the newsletter and how they can reach you. Well, the newsletter is simply Manhattan BP, like borough president, dot NYC, dot gov slash sign up. And if you wanna reach me directly, I am very accessible as your borough president in Manhattan. 212-669-8191 or gbrewer at manhattanbp.nyc.gov. Gail, thank you so much for, for sitting with me today and talking. Uh, we, we just love you so much, so thank you. Thank you very much. And thank you to MNN for being there and for your wonderful program. Mm -hmm.